podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 105 with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook, and we are on The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. One of the things, I think we've touched on this in... Touched on so many things. Yeah, but in our training, I think it was touched on you know advertising and marketing ourselves as therapists which is the title of this is really important it is and i just said off off air and i might have said it at the end of the last podcast how well known i was um in the area of advertising because from the word dot i probably put 10 to 12 percent maybe even more we'll say to 10 to 12 percent because i think that's a fair uh, truth here of money I earned back into advertising. That's a, that's quite a high percentage, that is, isn't it, Bob? That's why I said it. But if you go to go to any book, well, not any books, but I think if if you went to, well, maybe I'll be wrong actually. But anyway, if you went to a book that talked about marketing, they talk about eight to ten percent, and I've always done more. So let me break this down a bit, Bob. For, okay, for any break people it that down, are break it down. Because <laughs> if you're saying 10 to 12 percent yes. yeah, of, of your income, yes. and then we look at you know the, the insurance that we have to pay and the room that we have to pay, and you know, being a member of the BACP if we need to do that, and you know, being a member of a governing body and all this sort of thing. It chips away at the income that we actually end up with at the end of the day. Yes, it does. But you well, know, it is Dan- important because if people don't know who we are or what we're doing, we're not going to get any clients anyway. So yeah, we're not going to get any clients anyway, are we? It's we. It, it's there's a fine line, isn't there, in how we market ourselves? Yeah, and of course, there's a psychology behind it. Yeah. So. Um, if you're somebody who doesn't invest in yourself that much, you might find it hard to invest, your, invest yourself externally as well. Yeah. So in other words, you know, when I've given seminars on this over the years, and I talk about the psychological part of advertising, linking it to a person's personality, you know, many, many, and people gone into groups to discuss it. Many people say, well, it just isn't me. You know, it just isn't me to do X, X, and X. I can tell you, Jackie, in my earlier days, I wherever I was, I used to talk about my job. I'm not talking about on holidays particularly, but uh, I suppose I'm really talking about networking. Yes, yes. I would go out of my way to network a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous lot. Um, before the before the whole event advent or you know of social media, um, internet phone you know phones and all these mobile phones and internet and all that sort of stuff, the question is where did you advertise? I, now back in those days, um, when I started off seeing clients, I advertised in so many places. But I, I remember spending a lot of money, if you talk about 8 to 10% of um, income, in what was called yellow pages back then. Oh, I remember the good old yellow pages where they used to have, let your fingers do the walking or whatever the slogan was. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to take big pages out and spend a lot of money on it. And people thought I was mad to spend that money on it. But um, it got... I it all how can I explain? My name got known. Yeah, yeah. And I got clients from it. And I realised then that the only way people know you're actually there is to tell them you're there. Um, yeah. And you might have to do spend quite a lot of money to do that. I I, I used to go around universities, colleges, putting my leaflets 
on the boards, the casting course boards, if you like. Yeah. I used to go to many of the naturopaths, the uh, places that had cafes and places that where you could put, you know, your cards up or uh, leaflet about yourself. I used to traipse miles doing this. And I also, um, in 1986, um, started to teach the fundamentals of transaction analysis um, at the, what was called the Extra Mule Department of Manchester University. So 6.30 to 8.30, every Wednesday, uh, where people who were interested in continuing education and history or politics or psychology or whatever it was. Yeah. We took in the university extra meal handbook and there's find something to say, explore and take charge of your life by Bob Cook. Learn the principles of transaction analysis. And from that two hour, you know, teachings that I did for eight weeks or whatever it is, I might get three or four clients. Mm. Or I might from there take me into another workshop that I did on understanding your own life and from that becomes that a bit like a rolling stone absolutely and I, I you touched on it at the beginning I think it's really important it, it's it's being vulnerable enough to tell people what it is that you do and you know I'll hold my hand up to this it it's 10 years since I started you know training <clears throat> to be a psychotherapist and it's only this year that I felt comfortable advertising myself mm. to people that I know and can speak to. I've joined a networking group this year, a, a women's only networking group, which is absolutely amazing for support around that. But yeah, I felt really conscious about blowing my own trumpet and all those sorts of... Yeah, and it's because what I said earlier, and you're saying it personally, so thank you for saying that, it's linked to self-worth. Absolutely. My, my that's that's my own personal experience of it, definitely, 100%. Yeah. It's linked to what is often called nowadays imposter syndrome. Yeah. Hang, hold my hand up to that one as well. <laughs> we, did a we did a podcast about four months ago on the imposter syndrome. Yeah. So what you're talking about is very, very true for a lot of people not feeling they're worthwhile or I've got to do you know not just do four years of training I've got to do eight years of training I've got to have seen at least 50 clients I've got to xxxxx before yeah. I can be worthy enough to be yeah. able to advertise and as for running a group that as to as for running a teaching group about what I've learned about for the last 10 years well that's a step too far you know, it's linked into self-worth, linked into our own ego, if you like. Absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah I completely yeah. resonate with that. And I think, you know, I don't know whether it's it's just me or not, but psychotherapy as a, a profession is, I found it to be quite clicky. Do you know what I mean? It, it was very professional and quite highbrow, and I never felt part of that. Oh, oh, oh. you know it, it's very academic and all those sort of things so from the get-go I think I felt not worthy somehow of having the title of being a psychotherapist you know people say to me now so you mean you're a coach I said well no I'm a psychotherapist I'm very proud of it <laughs> yeah yeah I think that's important on the psychology of all this lot if I gave some yeah, we have to address the psychological process that we just talked about here. Yeah. About if I had to give some practical tips, though, number one would be networking. Yeah. Without a doubt. And what I mean by networking is networking with your colleagues that know you, networking in areas like you've just talked about one, which might have, I think you said, a business club is it or yeah it's a women's only it's called unique ladies and it's it's women entrepreneurs and business yeah. people yeah. yeah networking there 
So you're prepared to go and I see networking even more of a step forward, but you're prepared to go and give little talks. I did that this week. I stepped out yeah. of my comfort zone and did a 10 minute talk. <laughs> so it's those sorts of things, whether it's at a golf club, whether it's at a university, whether it's in areas you talked about, but you take the opportunity to talk about what you do. Yeah. Uh, might have peer groups, might have support groups, all these different areas. Uh, so networking. Secondly, and this is again linked to psychological processes, but I'm going to talk about it on a practical level as well. Be proactive. If you end up, if you, you know, are invested in passivity, then your business will stay passive. Yeah. And no one's going to know about you. That's the key, Bob, is people need to know about you. They're not going to find you unless you're out there talking about what it is that you do. And I struggled with that a lot. Yeah. Thirdly, get a mentor. In other words, look around and see, you know, a professional psychotherapist that you admire, that, that is a, all the things that you'd like to be, all the things that we're talking about here. And, you know, phone up or, you know, nowadays, email, social, lots of things. Uh, or just think how they would do it or how they've done it or whatever ways you want to look at this. Or even a mentor of somebody who's been successful in other areas of their life. Are you looking for another string to your bow or arrow, Bob, that you can... Uh... Be a business mentor or psychotherapist. <laughs> I don't mind people doing that and I don't know about it um, particularly. But I, I don't mind. I, mean, I, I, I've done this for 40 years. But, 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 but look for people who have been successful in other areas. Yeah. You don't have to be a Sh Alan Sugar of this world, but you could think about, oh, who's been successful? I would like to perhaps have as a mentor and they might never know about it. Yeah but at least you've got some sort of model to think about. Yeah. Absolutely. Because unless you do that, you have got no, you don't know where you're going in a way. No. For me, one of the things that I know works for me is to be accountable and to have an accountability buddy. So somebody that I can kind of work with on the journey, I'm much more likely to do it than if I'm just, self-motivating and doing it on my own if that makes sense great and i love the term accountability buddy yeah that's a great term and i think what you mean by that is somebody you're accountable with or to for the levels of proactivity or what you're doing absolutely 100 percent. yeah almost like you know i do quite a lot of walking and i probably quite frustrated with the amount of joggers have come along but that's another story <laughs> uh, but the, i see a lot of joggers with their friends jogging along and talking to each other yeah the same journey and i think are they preparing for a marathon are they just jogging along is it a friendship duo yeah i have that fantasy about what the joggers are doing as they're talking to each other and everything else but you know they are they're probably just on a journey together whatever it is yeah and maybe maybe they're accountable buddies and they get the person up at six o'clock and say let's you let's know do it. Yeah. that's what yeah. you mean by accountability yeah. i like that term yeah i think that's a really important tip yeah i also that's all the practical stuff how important it is to get a website websites yeah. uh why they're useful is well they're useful if you <sighs> Again, it's about mentorship, isn't it? Just getting people who are successful and look at their websites and everything that goes with that. Uh, and, and I know that it takes a lot, perhaps learning some of the Google algorithms and various other things, how you can get top of the list, and da, 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 da. Um, uh, but in today's world, if you're a counsel or therapist, you need to join, just starting off, you need to join their online the online directories. So, yeah. for example, in the psychotherapy world, I think the most popular one that gets clients, it's, people might say others, 
is counseling. Um, it's not counseling directly for counselors, but psychology.com or psychology.co.uk for therapists. Uh, they're very important. I can think of many directories uh, that I think we can need to put ourselves in. And then, of course, when I say this to trainees, they come back and say, well, it's all very expensive. And if I've got to put this into counseling directory and I've got to put this into psychology.com and I've got to get insurance, all the things you said about half an hour ago in the podcast, wow. I've got no money left for myself. Yeah. So you have to be selective, I think. That is true. Yeah. I think at least five directories, but I know the two that I will go in. And that would be counsellingdirectory.com and probably counselling direct no psychology today, isn't it? That's right. Psychologytoday.co.uk and counselling directory probably. Um, networking I'll be doing. So these are all the practical things. But you know, the most important is to be proactive rather than be passive. And if that's a therapeutic issue, take it to therapy. Yeah. And it, it can be an issue, do you know what I mean, for some people, like you were saying about imposter syndrome or, you know, it, it being vulnerable and laying yourself open and, and, you know, talking about yourselves and everything. That That's scripty stuff, a lot of that. Being yeah. successful, talking about how much you charge, do you know what I mean, and, and the money things can be a real hurdle for some people. It is, and I think it depends. People listening to this may be people who are, still you know training there might be people who've just started off their clinical world and might be people who have been you know working for a while um so they can help people who are perhaps just coming into our into our world but many of the things that we're talking about here i think especially the psychological things i think are important but i do know something else and that is that well i've just said it proactivity rather than passivity but it may be a psychological issue you just said that didn't you imposter yeah. syndrome, all these sorts of other things um, yeah, i think nowadays as well that it is quite important that we are our brand do you know what i mean and i think as psychotherapists we are all unique and individual and it's about you embracing your uniqueness you know what's your area of expertise what's your niche you know and and using that to your advantage you know you spelled out what i was gonna yeah. have i I'm pinched just, it off you bob sorry the next <laughs> is uh your unique selling point yeah uh, and you need to become a specialist yes and your specialism yes that's you you've said it completely and and I've seen you a bit on Facebook recently, and I also know, know Jackie, some of your own unique uh, selling points, and I know you do it yourself. It's took me a while to get there. Yeah. And, what you know, I always struggled with what my niche was. You know, some people go to it off the bat and they know the type of people that who they want to work with. You know, and sometimes we're told to not throw a net out and try and attract everybody, but to, you know, narrow it and have a niche. I always struggled with a niche. I never knew what my niche was. Well, but you've done really well. I, I've noticed you have. And I, okay. Another area I did want to cover on this podcast though. I, it's personal, but it's also professional and it's also for people to be aware. But as you start following some of the things I'm talking about, and you start to be wedded to success rather than failure. And as you start to become successful and you start to put your abundance theories into practice, you will probably attract unconscious envy mm. from certainly other professionals and people who aren't as successful as you. Um, and they may not even realize that. But I know something over the years, and it took me a long time to just understand that that's part of what I felt for a long time and probably not going to change and to live with the process. But for a long time, I used to feel a lot of um, people's envy. 
of my own success and and particularly the Manchester Institute for Psychotherapy success. And a lot of it was unconscious. Yeah. Um, Some people say to me, well, a lot of it wasn't. But but I when I feel a lot of the envy in my stomach from other people that projected onto me, um, for a long time I struggled to learn how to live with that unconscious envy. But I think it can happen in a minor way for many people when they start to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, I I can I can see that, and it's a shame. It is a shame because you know. A lot of people think it's overnight success. You know, what what they got that I've not and why do they deserve it? But I don't think there's such a thing as overnight success. You said you worked really hard and putting, you know, 10 to 12 percent into it and walking the streets and putting posters up and, you know, teaching and training and everything in order to be where you were successful. But some people would probably have thought that you just, it just happened. <laughs> you didn't see behind the scenes at all the work that you did. Oh, you are 100% correct. And for most people, that's how it is. Yeah. A lot of people that are successful over time, that's exactly how it's been. That with the success I'm talking about comes a lot of work. Mm. Yeah. A lot of learning by my own mistakes. Yeah. A lot of dealing with unconscious envy, a lot of, well, I don't know where my work ethic particularly came from, but a lot of work certainly, certainly did not come overnight. But I, I, I now enjoy my success, by the way, and that's taken a whole thing to learn. Uh, that's another whole story. Good, and I'm glad. But I think, I don't, maybe I'm making this up, I don't know, but for me, psychotherapy is one of those rare breed that it's like a a rolling stone it takes a while to get it going to get do you know what I mean word of mouth that spreads and people recommending you and it it can be two or three years down the line before you start to reap the rewards of the things that you do in the early days absolutely you know and I never really really realized it Jack it sounds stupid now and perhaps people listening to me might think gosh how come he didn't realize that but it, I didn't realise exactly what you're talking about because in the world of psychotherapy, one of the reasons, you, one of the sort of ways you become successful is by recommendation. Mm. I think it's the best way to get clients, yeah. yeah. But of course you have to be going a while to get recommendation, to get recommendation, to get recommendation. You can't suddenly um, say this to trainees all the time, you can't suddenly just suddenly become, you know, where everybody, where people know to you about you to that level. Yeah. You know, as you start, you're probably right, three or four years at least, because then people start recommending friends, recommending yeah. peers. Have you gone and have you gone to Jackie? She's really good in this area. I, I've used her services before. Um, you know, it's a XXXX. But that takes time. It's a bit like a rolling stone, as you said. And I think the unfortunate thing is that some psychotherapists give up before that three-year point. Yeah. When if they'd have just hung on for that little bit longer, things would have started to get better. Wonderful. I mean, you know, the amount of are you you're absolutely correct. If they have expectations above their own means, they may well give up. Yeah, which is a shame. It's a terrible shame because I think three years is a good, I think three years probably is a good time frame to say this. If you look, get to the three years yeah. and see how many people are recommending you and you'll see that you've done pretty well. I'd, I'd say it was definitely the three year point that I noticed that people were coming to me via somebody else that I'd, I'd seen, do you know what I mean, that had recommended them or me to them yeah and almost we're in the type of business where it has to be that way Mm. yeah and you are right again 
unfortunately, and I don't know the research on all this, but it's certainly worthwhile doing some research, I would think. But quite a lot of quite a lot of therapists do give up before the three year before getting yeah. to the three year mark. Yeah, and it's a shame because it, it is a, a it's a it's a hefty investment that we're making in ourselves to to become qualified and you know to then say to somebody, well, it could be three years before you actually start making any half decent money from it. It's it's a lot to take on. Yeah, but you know, I I'm always saying that sort of thing. I don't know if people heed it, but I think, you know, one of the worst enemies will be if they have these expectations, uh, which are so high, they will be disappointed so quickly. Yeah. And so I think you, it's, it's worth mentioning that, you know, I'm biased and talking a lot about being self-employed and being in private practice you know a lot of psychotherapists will be employed by somebody else where they don't need to advertise and they go in and do a job and they get paid a wage and it's completely different to it's a completely different ball game yeah as a teacher for eight years i lectured at a couple of colleges um and the last college have been there seven years and i felt so trapped in the job i didn't want to be a uh, teacher anymore but I also got trapped in the bureaucracy the amount of work that I thought was just a uh, bureaucracy like I said and um, I just decided to go myself and I've never looked back since I decided to do that at 36 now that 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 that's so I carved my own destiny out and thank god I did have to do it my own way anyway but you are right. A lot of people like the safety, the mm. security, the stability of being in an organisation uh, and haven't got these hoops to get through, all these barriers to get through. Um. But if they're in that place, I think it's hard for them to appreciate the world we're talking about. Yeah. They are two different things completely yeah because it, you, it's like a guaranteed income if you're employed whereas you know for somebody that's self-employed we are the face of our business and and we need to be out there you can't sit back on your your laurels you're constantly like you're saying advertising the manchester institute you know the leaflets the you know the training that goes on in there not just you know it, it, it's everything well i am the no disrespect to all my trainers but terms of the public face yes if it's bob cook exactly yeah it's taken a long time to get to like you said said so we're saying a lot of things but you know to activity and i know the psychological issues here around needing to work to needing to work to taking ownership of success rather than petrification of fear yeah because if we go to a level of petrification we tend to freeze if we go to that place we end up passive and if we go to that place we end up static and that's not a good place to be yeah so we may need to go to our therapist and we may need to have our support networks we may need to have our mentors we may need to do what you said in terms of expectations we may need to all the things we've been talking on this podcast are important to reflect on. Yeah. And, you know, be, when you were saying about being a mentor and things like that, you know, ultimately, I'm not a businesswoman. I, I, I don't think I'm very good at marketing myself. So I need to go to somebody that is used to, you know, marketing a business and is a business person, you know, for me to progress. So it's not always about talking to other therapists. It's about getting somebody who's going to be of use to you to market your business. Yes, that's what I was saying about being a get a mentor. And if they even if they don't know you are a mentor. Yeah. 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 Because I'm I'm a rubbish business person. I'm the first one I will hold my hand up. Do you know what I mean? My son is the one that gives me a bit of a shove and a nudge and says you need to be doing more of this, Mum. But it doesn't come naturally to me at all. No, I don't think it did for me. I know one thing, though, you know, 
yeah yeah i think i was going to say learning by my mistakes has become very important for me uh and various other things but i do think having a mentor having mm -hmm. somebody to talk to doing networking putting your stuff in all the places you need to put your stuff in do all the practical stuff and then it boils down maybe to the psychological process and that you might do fantasies, dream work, imagining work, all sorts of things about being successful and what it's like being successful. Yeah. And then you'll probably need to look at how come you're still sabotaging yourself being successful. You know, you know, in the end, Jackie, what it comes down to really, really comes down to, and that's the capacity to invest in yourself. And I like that. You invest in yourself at a psychological level first. And that will then lead to capacity to invest yourself at a practical level. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to. We are investing in ourselves and we need to do that. Yeah. Mm. And maybe that podcast could have been called Investing in Yourself, but that's what it boils down to in the end. And investing in yourself in many areas, your own psychological therapy, your own success, your all the things we're talking about, it boils down to that. Yeah. And also to get people, colleagues, uh, friends, support systems to enable you to invest in yourself. It's part of the same process. Yeah. And That's I think sometimes we think that there's an awful lot of therapists out there and there isn't enough room for us. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's too many. And I don't think that's true at all. I think there's a place for all of us. Yeah. If you are in a street where there's one shoe shop, yeah, you might have a fear of other shoe shops coming along. But I tell you what, if eight more shoe shops come along in that long road, you'll get more people because more people will come to the that road because they know it's a, a, a good place to go to get shoes. Yeah. No, but I understand that people don't think that way. Absolutely, yeah. Do you know? It's like I can remember when I, because I trained at the Manchester Institute, and I, I don't know who it was, but it said if you throw a stone, you're bound to hit a psychotherapist in this area because there's a lot of them around. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But that that's good because you know that's where people are going to go if they want a psychotherapist because they know that there's a lot of psychotherapists there. <laughs> Absolutely, and if we really look at the figures of uh, great, you know, Manchester, one and a half million people, maybe it's two, three million greater Manchester County, Bolton and Preston, all this lot. And then you start looking at how many therapists there are and how many counsellors are. There's not many compared to two or three million. Yeah. But the, uh, where I live in South Manchester, where my institute is in South Manchester, there's many, 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 many therapists, and many of them are because they're attracted to my institute and perhaps others. Mm. And so, therefore, South Manchester is a really good place to get clients. It, it sort of all goes together. If yeah. you have a fear, why you just do it? It's all it's fears, isn't it? It is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and and competition. Yeah, you know, fear of competition. But I I think you know maybe I'm biased here or not, but I think sometimes psychotherapists aren't very good at having competition around them. No, they're not. They're very, and usually they're not very good at business. Yeah, yeah. We don't promote each other. Do you know what I mean? We, or it's, it's, yeah. It's like yeah. there's just a few people that need therapy and we're all chasing the same thing. And it's not. You said it yourself. You know, in my area, the Greater Manchester area, there's three million people. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of people there for us all. <laughs> Steph said, many times I suppose I've said oh over the last 30 years I'm not very good at business but you know Steph used to ask my wife you say well you know the sort of shows you're most attracted to Bob I said no she said Dragon's Den The yeah. Apprentice <laughs> so yeah. I was yeah. attracted to business shows yeah um, and if you watch The Apprentice you will really see the epitome of people who actually uh, aren't very good at business at all um, but they they probably look up to Alan Sugar, and they and probably have got some sort of mentor that really helps them there. So, but I do know one thing, and maybe it's the ending of this podcast. I don't know, but investment, the capacity of investment in yourself, in all the areas we've talked about, 
is the key to success. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. And don't give up. Keep going. <laughs> it, that's absolutely. Just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so again, Bob, I, I, I've made notes on that. The, the, you know, networking, be proactive, get a mentor, all these sort of things. Yeah. Great. So what I've got for the next one, Bob, I'm not sure whether you want to do this one, but it was on your list, was the top 10 questions clients ask in therapy. Oh, I would love that. I just, <clears throat> I would love that. And I'll tell you why I would love that. It's because, well, it's great for podcast listeners to listen to that, I think. But it would remind, I know this is a bit egocentric, isn't it? But it's going to remind me of all the wonderful clients that I've been honoured to meet in my clinical life who've asked me so many questions ah, so that's right. a good one for the next time is it bob yes i love talking about those sorts of things right so that's what we're doing on the next podcast yeah because you see i don't want therapists or people who are listening to this podcast to be afraid of question of questions they might have to answer mm. or think of it in terms of oh you know this stuff of women being imposter syndrome and all that sort of stuff because it's part of part of a relational psychotherapy is the clients who ask questions. Yeah. Oh, and it's good to be oh. challenged sometimes. You know, I I've been asked questions. I, I know we, we, we can't talk that much about this because it's in the next podcast, but oh, I'm okay with saying, do you know, I'm not actually sure what the answer to that is, but leave it with me and I'll get back to you. Let's not leave let's, let's not sort of take our thunder, as they say. Yeah. Uh, oh no, I'm quite happy talking about that. It's obviously what I put in the title list. It's it's obviously it's in your list, Bob. So until next time, we're talking about questions in therapy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jackie. Bye -bye. Take care. You've been listening to the Therapy Show, behind closed doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.